as I mentioned before, in Chicago, we got motivated to be part of this operation, right? We saw the opportunity. We were invited by Jerry Tracy to come participate in these studies. New York hasn't been so fortunate. New York has lost firefighters in these wind-driven fires, all right? And Jerry Tracy is going to spend some time talking to you about their motivation, what brought them here, and it will help lead us into why this is so important and what the possible consequences are if we fail to understand and we fail to learn how to survive these kinds of events. Because they're happening with increasing frequency, largely because of the change in the fuel load, right? Wind has always been around, fire has always been around, but with the change in the fuel load, they're becoming more dangerous than ever before. Right? So without stretching this out too far, I'd just like to introduce Jerry Tracy to you, let him speak to you about what brought New York to the table. Jerry. Thank you. Understanding, surviving, and fighting the battle, it's more than just wind-driven fires. We come to realize a history, a history of many years. This particular slide is really just going to focus on events that happened from the 80s on. An understanding of fire behavior in high-rise buildings. And the very first incident that we talk about right there, Montrose Avenue, Brooklyn, one civilian fatality, 108 truck was first due at that fire. And it was a wind-driven fire in an apartment, an end apartment. And our firefighters went up there, and they launched a tactic, a strategy that was inbred. We had a document, or we have a document, Firefighting Procedures, Multiple Dwellings, and it has 58 pages focused on fighting fires in ordinary construction, non-fireproof apartment houses. And maybe the last six pages focused on fireproof multiple dwellings. That was the emphasis that the FDNY placed on these structures, almost alluding to the fact that they were routine fires. But what I will tell you our department approached those fires as if we were fighting fires in ordinary construction. And I'll call it tenement tactics. And you could almost say that fire departments throughout the United States, how we, to say the fire service, how we've evolved in strategy and tactics was based upon what worked for us from the early days of horse-drawn pumps. What tactics worked, what didn't work, we improved them a little bit. And these were the tactics that we're bringing into high-rise structures. And to say, were well, we learning lessons? Well, these events, they didn't happen every year. 1980, 89 was the next fire. And that was Horace Harding Expressway in Queens. There were some civilians actually rescued at that uh, particular fire. And one of the rescues was made by a firefighter out of 108 truck who was now a lieutenant in Queens. He was working in 138. And then Park Avenue in the Bronx. And the, the firefighters that were interviewed from that particular fire, when they were coming out of the stairwell, the attack stairwell, they were certainly faced with a fire that one hand line, they couldn't make the turn, they brought up a second, they brought up three. They couldn't even get into the hallway because the heat was that intense. And they also realized the phenomenon that the woman from the fire apartment, she had left her apartment, walked down the hallway, was knocking on doors. She wanted someone to call 911. And another occupant on the other side of the hallway opened their door. And those two women were found in that apartment dead after the fire with the woman still with the phone in her hand. The heat currents had traveled down the hallway into that apartment. So now we're starting to see things that we never saw before. Why, why did that happen? Heat currents. What are the conditions? What are the environments inside these buildings to start saying, we gotta, there's more we have to learn. There's questions that ha don't have answers. And it goes on and on. Lincoln Place, Manhattan. I was the captain of 35 truck. That was Lionel Hampton's apartment. 30 firefighters went to the hospital. And it was then, it wasn't just me, but to say questions were, there has to be other ways of doing this because we were just throwing people at that fire. 
Engine companies were coming out of the hallway, they were burnt. Give me another engine company. By the time they made it to the fire apartment, it took them 45 minutes to move 54 feet, and by the time they got to that fire apartment, much of the fuel had been burnt away. But we were still launching the same attack, the direct frontal attack. Marty and I were firefighters in the 108 truck in Brooklyn, and Marty was one firefighter in the house that he, he was saying, when you go into the apartment, you have to close the door to do the search, because if a window fails, you're giving this fire a path. And many of us fought him on that issue to say, no, if I go in that fire apartment and if I need to get out, if conditions change, I don't want anything obstructing me. So we used to chalk the door. We were giving the fire a path. We didn't understand the dynamics and the currents and how this pressure phenomenon, the fire phenomenon, would travel to other areas in the hallway, and the hallway was now becoming part of the fire area. We didn't have that understanding. And it goes on and on. What aside, well, Vandalia, we'll speak about that. Actually, a couple of weeks after Vandalia, we had a, a wind-driven fire. It's not up there. There was four civilian fatalities, and Macaulay Culkin's uh, apartment was also wind-driven. And uh, again, scores of firefighters sent to the hospital. Confucius Plaza, another wind-driven fire. Beach Channel Drive, you see these dates? January 26th, February 26th. Well, starting back in 98, I had the pleasure of meeting Dan Medrukowski at a fire conference to start talking to an engineer to say, we need help. We need help in understanding fire behavior. And in all of those years, uh, we were trying to acquire buildings and get the studies done. Buildings had come and gone uh, for whatever, various reasons, asbestos in the building, so on and so forth. And it was in 2006, these two back-to-back -back fires, that it seemed that the planets aligned for us. A building became available, and we were going to launch our study. Our study took us, and we'll talk about it in a moment, it took us to Toledo, uh, to a high-rise uh, office building uh, with no fire, and Chicago joined us. Had Chicago never joined this effort, we wouldn't be standing here talking to you today. Their department was such a profound uh, influence, and uh, their commissioner, Ray Orozco, supported us so much that uh, they acquired a building and we were able to do some live burns, and that moved on to New York as well. The New York study happened February of this year, and if you notice these dates, in January, we had a wind-driven fire in Brooklyn before we even launched our live fire research where a lieutenant was killed. And he was killed right at the apartment door. He was in the current. He was in the path. And since then, in March and April, and many of these fires were not on the upper floors to say, oh my God, it has to be a high-rise building. And wind-driven events do not necessarily have to be in a fireproof or a high-rise. They can be in a private dwelling. What we're learning, what we're going to be talking here today is specific to high-rise buildings, but much of what we're learning in the disciplines, the training we have to give the fire service, the disciplines has to be in every type of structure because wind can be present at any fire. Absolutely. To say the most eye-opening event Vandalia Avenue. This is Lieutenant Cavalieri, Firefighter Bohan, and Firefighter Bob. These three firefighters, they were approaching the fire apartment. They were in the hallway outside the fire apartment, approaching the fire apartment to one, close the door, maintain control of that door. These are two pictures of the front side of the building. If you if you will, exposure one, the A side. And the A side is the downwind side, and you'll, you'll note there's some soot stains at those windows right there. That was not the fire apartment. The fire apartment was on the exposure three, the C side, and it was an apartment right here on the end of the building. The fire started there. The windows were not open, and the windows hadn't failed. The woman who had occupied the, the apartment, and the apartment was sparsely furnished. It wasn't heavily loaded with fuel. She had left the door open, exited the apartment, and when our units arrived, fire was showing at those windows. And in interviewing the firefighters, 
the roof firefighter, uh, the team, one of the firefighters on the roof, he had uh, commented that at times, and he had vented the bulkhead, by the way, the bulkhead meaning the attack stairwell, roof door, was open because that was our policy. Our policy was to implement vertical ventilation as soon as possible, again, going back to tenement tactics because conditions on the fire floor would lift and things like that, not understanding that if the fire was looking for a path, that was offering a path of low pressure. He was at roof level and he was looking over the parapet wall and he commented that at times he'd see flames blowing out and then they would disappear back into the building to think that maybe the wind was gusting or changing. There'd be a wind, there wasn't a wind, was the thought. But now what we've come to learn through this research, what we've learned is the apartment, even though it had a path, the apartment door was open, and once the windows failed and the fire had a path, the fire apartment was being overpressurized to the point where fire was spitting back out the window. And we're referring to that as pulsating. And that is what he was witnessing. And fire was pulsating out those windows. The reason we have soot stains there, and I'm going to give you a hallway view as well to give you an understanding. Our three firefighters were right here. They came through this uh, elevator lobby, that's a smoke stop door, and they were in this area of the hallway approaching this fire apartment that the apartment door had been left open. When the window failed, it was sort of in the same time frame that an occupant of this apartment either heard commo commotion in a hallway, uh, wanted to hear or see what was going on, had or had smoke coming in the apartment, the windows of his apartment was open, he opened that door and even though the fire had a path, a path of travel to the attack stairwell and up out the roof bulkhead and our firefighters wanting to launch an attack there were taking a tremendous beating. Even though that fire had a path, this gave it an additional path, it shared the vent. And the heat that traveled down this hallway overwhelmed those three firefighters where they stood. The medical examiner termed their death thermal shock. Have you ever heard that in the fire service before? Where this heat was so extreme their organs shut down. And that's what happened to those three firefighters. Lieutenant Cavalieri, Firefighter Bohan, and Firefighter Bob. That was the hallway. They were doing their job. They were doing their job, trying to get down that hallway to get to that door, to close that door, to maintain control so that we could set up an attack, a direct frontal attack. We were not thinking about, do we have alternate strategies that we could launch here? To say, the training, the information that we're learning, the disciplines, the size-ups, meaning what we see, what is it telling us? What do, what do we want to look for when we get to the fire floor? If we can use a thermal imager and a door is still intact, and if the thermal imager, as we're coming down the hallway, is showing us currents, heat currents coming from around the door frame or out the peephole, is that telling us something? If we were to just come up the stairwell, arriving to the landing of the fire floor, and we were seeing smoke under pressure coming out from under that door, would that be telling us something? Under pressure. That could be telling us that the apartment door is open and we have window failure already if it's under pressure. So there's many things that we need to train and offer, not just our department, the fire service in general, of things we're going to say because it's understanding, surviving, and fighting these fires. The apartment itself, to say, was sparsely furnished. There was fuels there. The fuels today, we all know they're hydrocarbon based. Uh, Dan Medjukowski is going to be talking about the heat release rates from the garbage pail to the sofa for us to have an understanding of the tremendous heat. The ceiling and the floor panels in this particular building were precast concrete slabs. 
And here you can see the heat, how they were subject to spalling. This was a top floor fire on the 10th floor, so the loading was the roof. There was no significant weight on the roof. Had this been a lower floor fire, and let's just say the floor above had some significant weight, let's say it was a dentist's office or something like that, is it possible we could have had localized collapse? Absolutely, absolutely. So even there, building construction, the tremendous heat, it all plays a significant role. And to say the planets aligned for us in 2006, we have a friend, he's a deputy chief in Toledo, Ohio, had called Dan Medzikowski to say their department, Toledo, wanted to look at and research the use of fans controlling smoke in large structures. Could NIST help? And Dan said, you know, coincidentally, New York City is also wanting to do something very similar. They'd like to do their work in a high-rise building. And this deputy chief, Skip Coleman is his name, he says, I have a high-rise. Downtown Toledo, June of that year, we were testing in this 30-story high-rise building uh, where I get to meet Steve for the first time. And to say, was I impressed with a young man who I felt was so mature and had such a, a great understanding of fans, fire. He happens to be a chief in the College Park Fire Department. And our friends from Chicago, we joined together. And after that week of work, we said, you know, this is great. We, we found that we could pressurize stairwells. We can achieve those pressures that we know could hold back smoke from an ordinary fire, not a wind-driven fire. But we also said, and we all agreed, we have to do this with live fire. And if it wasn't for the relationship with the Chicago Fire Department and their commissioner, Ray Orozco, November of that year, we were then burning in this building in Chicago. And here, let's put you back to our PPV training. You can see how this went, right? <clears throat> Guy from Toledo says, yeah, I got a building. You can fill it up with some theater smoke, right? And we show up and go, oh, yeah? I got one you can burn. So we go and we burn in the city of Chicago, right? Of course, we forgot we brought New York with us. New York says, I got an island. Governor's Island is where we wound up doing these tests. The whole island they got for us to go out and do these experiments. Um, you picked up some, uh, you had the opportunity to pick up some DVDs as you walked in, and you can pick them up again as you, as you walk out. That report is complete. The, the work that NIST did in Toledo is complete. That report is out. And uh, from the Toledo and the Chicago experiments, and there's one uh, demonstration in that set of DVDs of a wind-driven fire that we created in Chicago. It was like, you know, we did these positive pressure experiments. We realized what we were trying to find out was, you know, a lot of modern high-rises have built-in positive pressure in the stairwells, right? The alarm goes off, the stairwells pressurized. Can we replicate that with portable equipment? And if so, how do you do it properly? What's required? Well, the short answer is, yeah, you can. And we learned a lot of interesting things about what works and what doesn't work. That's all been done. The, the report is out. And in the process of doing that, some of the guys from New York said, hey, what about this wind-driven thing? Can we try one of those? So we, we got a big MVU in Chicago, we call it. It's a big fan. It's like a 48-inch wide truck-mounted thing, 100 mile per hour wind. And we created a wind-driven fire, right, just to see what happened. And, and our jaws dropped, and we went, oh, my god. Right? And people started saying, yeah, that's it. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I meant. That's what we saw. Because the problem with these events up until now is that the people that really understand what took place ain't talking. They're not here to tell us. Right? They weren't found face down running out of the building. They weren't found on their backs blown down by the fire. They were found curled up in fetal positions because they said, oh, my God, I'm going to die. And that's exactly what they did. And it happens just that fast. You can't fight this fire. Once the event occurs, once it takes place, you can't combat it. So you have to be able to recognize it. You have to see it coming, and you have to have some alternative tactics. Eight New York City firefighters with three hose lines can't make it down a hallway? What kind of fire is that? It's a wind-driven fire. Four city of Chicago firefighters jump out of a fourth floor window 
Not go to the window, hang out the window, drop from the window, die out of a fourth floor window. And every last one of them would have told you if it was the 40th floor, we were going out just as fast. That's a wind-driven fire.